Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 78, recorded November 14th, 2012. Robert Stevens. Triangulation is brought to you by Stamps.com. Start using your time more effectively with Stamps.com. Use Stamps.com to buy and print real U.S. postage the instant you need it, right from your desk. For our special offer, visit Stamps.com, click on the microphone, and enter Triangulation. And by Ford, featuring available sync. Now you can control your media player with simple voice commands. Enjoy your drive while you easily search and listen to your favorite songs. Check it out on the 2012 Ford Focus and at Ford.com slash technology. And by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. If you're a media maker looking for video, photos, illustrations, music, sound effects, after effects templates, or 3D models, check out Pond5. And for an exclusive 50 free stock media downloads, go to pond5.com slash triangulation. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Triangulation. Filling in for Leo Laporte this week, who is enjoying a total solar eclipse in Australia somewhere on a boat, on a cruise ship. I'm Sarah Lane, and I'm really excited today to have Robert Stevens as my guest. Hello, Robert. Hello. How are you? I'm good. So it turns out that um, we know a lot of the same people. But oh. I didn't realize it until you walked in and said, hey, I was hanging out with your I was, other I wasn't going to reveal your details of your private life on air, but you're <laughs> welcome to do that if you all, like. That's, all we, uh. that's what we do, you know? <laughs> that's the bubble that we live in. So uh, anybody who's not familiar with Robert Stevens, I guess uh, you would be most well known as the founder of a service that many people have used and enjoyed and gotten a lot out of, and that's the Geek Squad. Well, there are two people, people who have used the Geek Squad and people who haven't yet had a problem but will. I guess there's a third group, and that's probably a lot of the viewers that watch this show and a lot of Leo's uh, shows. And that's because a lot of people in technology fancy themselves on not needing Geek Squad. And I always laugh because I'm like, listen, people, if you are sick and tired of doing tech support for your family and friends, that's what we exist for you for. I used to send cruise brochures to IT managers because I couldn't afford my own brochures. So I would call up Carnival Cruise Lines and they will send you cases of uh, cruise brochures and I would attach my business card and just tell IT server jockeys, when was the last time you took a vacation? Let us watch <laughs> the network for you back in the good old Lantastic and Windows server days. Yeah, exactly. So uh, Geek Squad started, if I'm not mistaken, in 1994, That's correct? Right. So that was, I graduated high school that year, and I remember being pretty much the only one of my friends who knew what the internet was and was actually accessing it regularly. Um, At that time, it was was kind of becoming something that people understood, but a lot of people didn't have a computer in their house, or it was something that, you know, everyone was, uh, you know, six people were sharing one, that sort of thing, so... Seems like it was a really good time for a lot of people to be learning a lot of stuff about the, about technology and getting a computer in the house and having a good reason to and then getting confused. Is that, is that, is that sort of the timing? Did the timing seem perfect for you in that way? Well, every generation is the best time. I mean, I right. remember being a kid. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm special or anything, but <laughs> I was born in 1969, the year we landed on the moon. Uh, and that same year in the fall, the first packet of what would become the internet was sent. Uh, in 71, you get the first Intel processor and Willy Wonka, the movie, uh, Pong, uh, Atari, Star Wars. Uh, I was the first generation with uh, cable TV and MTV. So that was a great time. And then I saw, I got my first personal computer, you know, a Commodore VIC-20. And I thought, personal computers, I thought, this is the best time to be alive because the stuff we were seeing in movies was beginning to actually be real. But then I went to college in the 90s and I saw the web and I thought, oh, it's not about the computers because they can't talk to each other. Now we've got a network. Yeah. This is the best time to be alive. And then, you know, 10 years ago, for anybody who was 14, 10 years ago with Facebook and social networking, that was even better. Oh, it's not about the computers talking to each other. It's about people talking to each other. But now we have mobile. 
And I wish I were 10 years old right now because if you were in the 70s and you were a kid in high school in the 70s like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and you understood what computers were going to be, you were at the beginning. And you could build computers or write software. And in the 90s, if you were Mark Andreessen or Linus or like myself in college, we were all the same age and saw the web, you could build, you know, be at the beginning of a whole new thing. But I will tell you right now, all of that is just like a dress rehearsal for what's about to happen with mobiles. And more importantly, the, the low-cost sensors that are in your mobile phone are just going to continue to get cheaper. And they're going to basically, we're going to... We're going to look back in 2012 and realize this was the year that the internet began to punch itself into the physical world. And that's when things start to get really interesting. So 2012, um, what, what exactly? I mean, are you talking about stuff like Square, about NFC, Google Wallet? No, I, I thought NFC would be great. But I keep a list of like in the beginning of the year, I start a new list. All the things I think are going to be big this year. And then during the year, I drop them onto stuff that's not likely to happen and things that did happen and kind of calibrate mm -hmm. my future uh, predicting capabilities. I agree with the critics that say NFC um, just we're not going to see it for a while. Even though Google's had it in their Nexus phones for a couple of years, where is it? It's kind of a catch-22. You know, I like what I don't know who said it, but they said if you're going to replace an incumbent or an incumbent technology, you can't be two times as good. You have to be 10x better. Right. And NFC is just not 10x better than what we have. So the idea of good enough um, is an important concept. But uh, I think uh, that we hit a major tipping point this year in the U.S. and the trend is around the world. We've tipped. There are more smartphones now than feature phones. That's the big tipping point. The next big tipping point that I'm watching is right now I think uh, I read that there's about five to six sensors in your cell phone right now. GPS, accelerometer, touch, two cameras. Those all count as sensors. Mm -hmm. By 2017, there's going to be like over 15 sensors in your phone. I don't know what they'll all be, but what that means is the overall Taking cost. Your pulse. I mean, who knows? Who, yeah, who knows? A variety of sensors. The cost per sensor is going to go down. And what that means is, for example... Uh, I mean, I, I only went to CES this year because I was at Best Buy back in January. And, uh, I mean, you learn more of reading blogs than you do by going to CES. But I saw a chip from Broadcom who makes all the Wi-Fi chips for everybody, for Apple, for Cisco. And uh, the Broadcom has a $4 Wi-Fi chip. When Wi-Fi chips get below 4 bucks, and they get to 2 bucks, and they get to $0.10. Cents. And that means that thermostats and... You know, those kind of things are going to be connected. And that's going to help Square. It's going to help all sorts of businesses like Uber. That's how, why you're seeing like these rental companies. I mean, I think the most exciting space in software right now is the idea of renting excess capacity. Uh, the idea to dispatch, to load balance the physical world is one of the most interesting trends. So Airbnb would be another example of that. I would say that Airbnb, Uber, OpenTable, even Groupon are all the same algorithm. They are... Algorithms to dispatch or publish excess capacity. You know, a Groupon really is a, you know, if a skydiver's got an extra 10 slots on the weekend, that's excess capacity. If there, every time a rental car sits on a lot every day, you mm -hmm. will never get that revenue back. Every empty seat on a plane. The idea of publishing this capacity in real time is the idea of load balancing the physical world. And up until this point, almost all software has been about load balancing digital capacity. Mm -hmm. But imagine what this is going to do for house painters, babysitters, landscapers, hair salons. We've well, got some of that already with TaskRabbit or Zarly or there's, there's, uh, there's Get It Now from Postmates where you've got people who are willing to step up. Like, tell me what you want to do because I have time. I'm sort of sitting here not making any money. I, I as the, you know, the commodity... And there's so many different second and third order effects that are going to come from that. One issue, I've been using Instacart, and it mm -hmm. works great. Uh, what I learned is that they don't mark up, by the way, milk, eggs, and bread. You know why? Because when we check prices against what it is actually at the grocery store, if you went and got it, because that's the benchmark, turns out they don't mark up the milk, eggs, and bread because that's the prices that we tend to check. And Instacart is one of the services that will basically go shopping for you and bring it to they your basically, door. They basically, yeah. Uh, in California here, we have Safeway. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in Minnesota where I was at, there's Cub Foods. You know, everybody has their local brand. So I was just going through this morning, um, actually going, you know, I'm Amazon Prime. Mm -hmm. Now they have three different things in Amazon Prime. 
They have Amazon Prime. They have subscription services. You subscribe to this shampoo on some frequency that you consume it, we'll take 5% off on top of Prime with no shipping. Then they have another one called add-on items. So if you add it to your cart and it's over 25 bucks, there's no charge for shipping. So the question is, what's the benchmark for like shampoo or any other kind of dry good like kitty litter or something like that? Right. Well, there is um, going to the store. There's using Instacart. And then there's going to Amazon. Then there's going to Target. Target doesn't publish the price of store items on their retail app or their website. I checked today. So I went and benchmarked like Jif peanut butter. I looked at all the things like, why would I ever drive anywhere to get peanut butter? The problem with Insta, <laughs> you know, because it's like if you, after you consume three of anything, an algorithm should basically be able to look at saying, boy, you're, you're consuming laundry soap at this frequency. And Amazon, I can guarantee you, is getting very close to the point of saying, if you sign up for a two-year commitment like you do with a cell phone, two-year service on shampoo, we'll give it to you for 5% below what you can get at Costco or Walmart. That's going to have labor implications you know, for jobs already on top of like retail. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with Instacart is TaskRabbit and all those services are great, but if you have somebody driving around the city to bring you a gallon of milk at the last minute, that does sort of have like some environmental impacts. There's also some inefficiency models in there, but all the people are going to come up with several different models. Like GeekSquad is like a task rabbit, only they're employees and they have benefits. Right. Not everybody in the world can become an independent contractor. Who's going to give uh, benefits to all these people? Who? So there's very some interesting dynamics on that. We, so we, I definitely want to get into um, some of just like the, the the early days of the Geek Squad and how it became part of Best Buy and how it grew and how your role changed. Um, we do want to take a quick break, uh, and for that, I'm going to kick it over to Leo Laporte to tell something we should know. Hey, guys, if you don't mind, I'd uh, <laughs> like to... I know I'm not here. I'm not here, really. But I am here to talk about Stamps.com. You don't mind that, do you? Uh, and then we'll get back to our interview in just a second. Stamps.com is uh, so fantastic. I'm such a fan. I, I came back from Australia just to... <laughs> <laughs> Just to tell you about it. You know about Stamps.com. Post office loves Stamps.com. It's funny because I have my, uh, somebody from the, I got a letter from uh, Dave, who is, he works for the Postal Service in Washington, D.C. And he came to visit us. And um, he says, call or email if you need anything postal. But he sent me this. It's almost like my... It's, he kind of misses me because I don't go to the post office anymore ever since I got stamps.com. I can buy my own U.S. postage online. I can print it from my own computer, my printer. I don't need a, a postage meter, a special ink, or anything. I, I just need stamps.com, Mac or PC. I do see my mailman, though, because a mail carrier comes and gets these packages and letters and envelopes. You print right on the envelope if you've got, uh, you know, you're doing out, sending out mailings of any kind. Uh, stamps.com. The, the software will put your return address, your, your sender's address or recipient's address, uh, but also will print the postage, print your logo, the whole thing. It's gorgeous. Very pro. Uh, it'll also do uh, mailing labels for packages, and it will, same thing, it'll fill out the forms needed. It'll uh, send an email out to, with tracking information if you're doing priority or express mail. It really is a full shipping solution, the kind like big businesses have. But it's affordable enough for uh, any small business, too. That's why we, we use Stamps.com, and I want you to try it. Uh, we have, I have a special no-risk trial offer for you. If you go to Stamps.com, click the radio microphone in the upper right-hand corner there. Please do that because i got a better, better deal than the, on the front page. You'll get a $110 bonus offer. Includes up to $55 in free postage for you to use. The digital scale that we use, I love this because it plugs into the USB port. You plop a letter or a package up to 25 pounds on it. And you know exactly how much postage. The, it's, you never pay more than you need to. I don't know if you've ever done that, but I always put an extra stamp or two on because I just never know. You get a $5 supply kit, four-week trial. You don't have to do it anymore. Not with Stamps.com. It's wonderful. Visit Stamps.com, click the radio microphone, and use our offer code TRIANGULATION to get this special deal. Remember, you have to use TRIANGULATION as the offer code. Stamps.com. Offer code triangulation and now we take you back to triangulation thanks for uh, letting me interrupt you're so welcome leo 
You can do it anytime. Back here with Robert Stevens, the founder of Geek Squad and someone who thinks a lot about the future of technology. But I promised everybody before uh, we went to our break, we're going to talk a little bit more about how the Geek Squad came from obviously a concept to something that was a viable business, a successful business, and eventually uh, something that, that, that merged into Best Buy. Were you just one guy and you kept fixing other people's computers and thought, you know, I should probably get paid for this? Yeah, I grew up in Chicago and, you know, I mean, I graduated in 87 from high school. and But the last year in high school, I'd taken all the computer classes I could. I mean, I wasn't really a computer nerd. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I hung out with girls and I followed this pretty girl <laughs> in an art class and realized uh, there are a lot more girls in art than there are in computer. Uh, so I went to art school. Um, for a year and a half, realized I didn't want to be a starving artist, and then I moved up to Minnesota um, because there was, frankly, less to do there than in Chicago. So here I am at, living in Minneapolis on the campus of the University of Minnesota, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, like there's a company called Razorfish, uh, yeah. which is really well known in web development. Well, the the people that founded that were from Minnesota, um, you know. I but I saw the first web browser and. Uh, Linus had just released the first version of Linux in like 1990, 1991. Mm -hmm. And so you could kind of see all these things coalescing. I thought I was going to get into web programming. But when you do that, you have to hire really smart programmers and give them equity. And I'd never run a business before. So I, to make extra money on the side, I was riding my mountain bike around the campus fixing computers, uh, like a lot of people. And I thought I'd just do that for a couple of years until I saved up enough money to get into web programming. And then what I realized is that you really have two kinds of businesses. There's glamorous businesses that everybody wants to do because it's either it makes more money or it's more exciting. And then there's the boring businesses of the world, which are 99% of all businesses. You know, travel or, you know, um, plumbing, computer repair. Mm -hmm. But all these businesses have uh, very interesting, like, problems to solve. And if you know anything about technology, that's where it gets really interesting is to apply technology. So routing. Uh, one of the problems when you have an in-home service is most in-home services to this day don't take credit cards, still are using paper invoices. And anybody who's watching this show uh, thinks that's utterly insane, and it is. That's how much still we have room to apply technology into businesses, right. like generating proposals. I mean, I only see mechanics. I got an estimate at a body shop, and the mechanic had an iPhone and was taking photos of the car. That's relatively recent, and he was kind of a young person. So um, the idea of applying technology to boring businesses is a big opportunity still to this day. So every time I had to figure out ways to like order parts online for in-home repair, hire employees, where to source uniforms, all those things – um, there was a ch there's a chance still to this day to redo them, uh, you know, more interestingly. I think a lot of people, when they think of the Geek Squad, they can think visually in their mind what the people are wearing, what the Geek Squad car looks like. Was that something that was important to you from from early on? Well, it was a necessity. I had no money for marketing. I always tell people the best thing ever to happen to me is I had no money when I started Geek Squad. I never raised any money. I don't even know what a Series B is, to be honest. Neither do I. And most of the conversations <laughs> I have in the Valley now that I live here are kind of useless because I'm not going to be I'm not going to be an investor. I don't, I don't even know what a venture round is. Uh, I just read Brad Feld's uh, book on venture deals, which is a great book, by the way. <laughs> Frankly, to learn some of these terms that I keep hearing at cocktail parties. Um, I didn't have any money and I was a college student and I didn't want to rack up any debt and I was really worried about taking anybody's money right. and losing it. So, you know, that's why service sucks in so many businesses because anybody can get into it. You don't need to get a factory or raise money. You just need a bicycle and a cell phone. And so um, because that's all I had, every, when you have no money for marketing, everything you do is marketing. So when I finally had to get a car, I thought – I'm just going to be another freaking car on the freeway. And we pass each other on the freeway all the time, but nobody knows it because everybody drives the same damn looking cars. And mm -hmm. it's the same with the companies. So I didn't do anything for a gimmick. A gimmick is something that has no functional use beyond getting your attention or grabbing your attention. The question is, can you have it be functional as well? We have to get to your home. I want it to be memorable. And I grew up with the Batmobile. That was like my first corporate vehicle in my head. That was a reference point. I think what most companies don't do a good job of is they 
they just slap their phone number on the side of a car. They just pick a name that doesn't stand out. I couldn't right. even afford an ad in the yellow pages. But the first thing I notice in computer repair, and you notice in every page in the yellow pages, the yellow page is this thing that people used to like use. I've so heard of it. It's yeah. a long story. They put but it on doorsteps. Nobody stands out. And quite, then it raises the issue. Even if you had money for advertising and now so, with social media, you have to be interesting. You have to be memorable. So first thing I want to do is show up on time, be nice, hire really good people, fix your computer, charge you a good rate. We charge flat rates so there's never any per hour charge. So that way you'd know what it was going to cost before I came out. Mm -hmm. So that way I dealt with like preventing anybody from being unhappy. And I offered basically like a year guarantee. If, if your computer crashed in the next year, I'd, I'd basically cover it. Um, and then, you know, this is what's fun about every business. Every detail matters. Even the language on your invoice, the, the feel of the paper, the uniforms you put people in. I had T-shirts and jeans when we first started, and that was okay, you know, when we were like four or five people. But then I had to make a decision. Okay, we have to look more professional. Do we wear suits? No, because everybody's kind of dressing down, and yeah. suits are expensive to dry clean, and my employees can't do it, and I can't afford to reimburse them for that. Do we wear polo shirts? Everybody wears polo shirts, and I hate polo shirts. No offense, anybody out there, but like <laughs> Target has the red polo shirt. Yeah. Best Buy has the blue polo shirt. You know, uh, poor T Mobile has the pink polo shirt. And then I was watching Apollo 13, and I'm sitting in the movie theater going, oh my God, NASA has a uniform. They just don't know it because they're nerds. Short sleeve shirt, I could get a JCPenney for $19.99. Clip on ties. I want to. Geeks don't really know how to tie ties. <laughs> if it gets jammed in the printer, it won't choke them right. to death. And then it was like, you know, this uniform will never be in style. So therefore, it can never go out of style. And it works and it's held up. We're almost 20 years old now. So what's funny is that you start with one function. We have to have something consistent that looks good, but it, I don't want it to look like Dilbert. That's why there's actually no pockets on the Geek Squad mm -hmm. shirts. And the reason there's no pocket is because there might be a pocket protector, and that's a cliche. So what we're trying to do is craft something that it's borrowed from NASA, but it's not directly derivative, and that's really tricky. Same thing with a black and white paint job. I, I, ha I had a bunch of old classic cars. My original vision was that each GeekSwat agent would pick their own unique vintage classic car and maintain it themselves. And we'd all be like this gang at night and driving around in between house calls going to get beers. That doesn't scale. So then I had to find like a car that had heat and safety belts and decent gas miles. And then lo and behold, every once in a while you get lucky. Volkswagen came out with the, the refashioned Beetle, which actually was the safest car in its class for insurance. And the black and white paint job I stole. I was watching Andy Griffith, this old TV show on TV land. And I'm like, the black and white. You know, and that's sort of like what we are. We're sort of like the cops when we show up. People are freaking out like a domestic disturbance. They're screaming. They're ready to throw the computer out the window. So I'm actually, there's a functional reason for that. Mm -hmm. Now the funny thing is, is that I think we have more geek mobiles than black and white police cars in this country. So Wasn't there a state that made you change the logo at some point because it looked too much like a highway patrol? It's California. It was? Yeah, California 10 years ago, uh, basically, they started pulling us over. They <laughs> first started pulling Geeks White agents over for tech support questions. <laughs> okay. They're like, hey, I have a problem with my Duke Nukem, my 3D video card. And then the cops started getting pulled over by civilians thinking that they were Geeks White agents. What? Yeah. How, do you, how does a civilian... That's a joke. Oh, all right. I was like, well, I mean... So California calls me and says, we're going to start ticketing your employees. You can't have... And now, the California statute actually says you can't have any two contrasting colors. It's not black and white. They're like, you can't even do green, purple, green. Technically, it's against the law. Why? Because people who are colorblind could get confused? This is California. Yeah, it's yeah, the yeah, People's no, it's Republic a, of California. A little bit of it, yeah. I've only lived here three months, but I'm beginning to... Yeah, I mean, I love it here. So anyway, <laughs> the cops were cool about it. They're like, listen, we actually don't care about you guys. Right. But if we let you do it, we got to let every crackpot. And they're like, we got a lot of crackpots in the state sure. of California. Yeah, I can understand So they were that. cool about it. And so we worked out a deal where the roof and the runner board is allowed to remain white, but the doors had to be changed black. I wanted to fight it. And this is like the, the one regret I have at Best Buy. I told Best Buy, I said, listen, Schwarzenegger's just become governor. He's a jock. 
I, we could totally play this up, the jock picking on the geek. Because we had letters coming in from people going, I can't believe the California Highway Patrol is making a stink about this. This is the stupidest thing I ever heard. I wanted to hire Eric Estrada, <laughs> who starred as uh, sure. on Chips in the mm-hmm. 1970s, and have him do in his full Chips regalia in the California Highway Patrol uniform, do like a YouTube video saying... Hi there. I've been asked by the Geek Squad. Apparently, uh, there's some confusion about the difference between a California Highway Patrol car and a Geek Mobile. Allow me to demonstrate the difference. He probably would have done it. I think he's like selling he totally would have done real it. estate That's on golf courses. I've out on it. This is like why I need to be CEO of a company again because I can't – sometimes you do things. They're like, but we're going to lose. We're not going to win the court case. I said, of course we're going to lose the court case. But sometimes a company should have fun and, and fight it anyway. Number one, you might win. Mm-hmm. Two, it's great PR. Mm-hmm. It doesn't hurt anybody. And we let's appeal it all the way to the steps of the California Supreme Court because companies shouldn't take themselves too seriously. So Now, when Geek Squad was, uh, was acquired by Best Buy, it was 10 years ago, right? Geek Squad acquired Best Buy. When Geek Squad acquired Best Buy, yes, thank you, um, ten, 10 years ago. And how many employees were you at that point? 65. 65. Now it's something like... 20,000. Yeah, 20 some thousand. 20, it varies like 20 to 25,000. Was the growth pretty steady during these last 10 years? Or did Best Buy ramp up really quick? Uh, there were a couple like areas like growth spurts like, where it ramped up really quick. Um, you know, they already had like 8,000 employees in the store. So we kind of converted them. Mm-hmm. You know, then you have call centers, you have repair centers. I mean, there's a repair center at the end of a UPS runway in Kentucky. That does like 3,000 laptops a day. You know, that's like logistically the fastest way. You drop it off at a Best Buy. If it needs to to leave the store, like a logic board replacement, it'll go there overnight, get worked on. I mean, a laptop repair only takes three hours. Most of the delays wherever you buy your computer for the repair is, you know, the parts and all that other stuff. Mm-hmm. Every Best Buy can't stock every computer part. Um, so you got all that spread out. And then you have, you know... GeekSquad is like the service arm for Best Buy. So even if you get an ice maker installed or a flat panel hung, um, and there's a test that just launched in Target, I think, uh, last week. 30 stores in Target mm-hmm. are also launching GeekSquad, uh, which is cool. And there was, there, there was or still is a partnership with Carphone Warehouse in the U.K.? Yep, yeah, this is a joint venture, a legal joint venture with Best Buy. So, yeah, there's GeekSquad agents in Barcelona, um, in Stockholm, in Dublin. All over uh, the place. Yeah, now they're doing, like, tablets and mobile phone, a lot of mobile phone migration, like, f- your content and, and your address book and stuff like that. And Carphone Warehouse is expanding into other categories. I love the name Carphone Warehouse. It's just, cr- it's so old <laughs> Outdated. Yeah. It's like, how is that really a great brand? Yeah, it's I, a horrible go- brand name. It's the uh, worst, and they but they're it. everywhere in London, and they're great stores. It's a testament. Uh, they're the largest mobile phone retailer in Europe. They also they go by the phone house in in the rest of mainland Europe. Uh huh. It's a testament to how good those leaders are in that company right. that they can be a successful business with a horrible name like Carphone Warehouse. <laughs> I mean, listen, I mean, I, so I may have a great good. brand and a great name, <laughs> but the truly talented executives of this world are the people who make money hand over fist with crappy brands yeah. and no marketing whatsoever. I just, my advice to everybody is, yes, you have to have a great product. You have to have great quality and a great corporate culture and hire great people. If you have a great brand and you have design and you think about all the details on top of that, that's the icing on the cake. Those are the things that matter. But the most important thing is that all these things that a lot of people associate with Geek Squad are not really for the public. They're really for the employees. I'm trying to attract a certain kind of person. You can't have an ego wearing the Geek Squad uniform. There's a lot of people who are very good at computer repair who are like Nick Burns, the, your company's computer repair guy from Saturday Night Live, <laughs> who are a bit arrogant. And there's a lot of people who are like, I'm not wearing that stupid clip-on tie. Mm-hmm. Everybody that wears that uniform at Geek Squad, they're the kind of person who is smart, they're enthusiastic about technology, and they're not going to make you feel like an idiot, you know? Because they're like, hey, I know computers. I don't have much of a social life, but I know computers, so I'm a nice person and, you know... Was that a struggle for you, go, getting to the point where Geek Squad and Best Buy are now one big company? There are a lot more employees. Like you said, you're not the CEO of Best Buy, and you might not necessarily have control over how all of the employees are acting, what their attitudes are, and how they're representing the brand when they're out there in people's houses. Well, you know, 
was when Geek Twelve was only like a month old. I knew it could be a global brand. I mm-hmm. designed it to be that way, and you know, I was twenty two, so everybody thinks like that when they're twenty two of dominating the world. And then you think about, well, could we go public or could we franchise? And you look at growth. So I would spend time talking to founders. Hey, you sold your company. Why'd you leave? Oh, well, the big company sucked and they're idiots and I hate it. Right. Them. Yeah. Okay. That's common. So you, you, know, you read all these stories in Fast Company Magazine. So I track down founders and say, why'd you leave? And after a while, you know, either people were self-aware and who'd say, I just like to do startups at early stage and then sell them and move and go and do a startup again. Those people are always very happy because they know what their own limits are. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what my limits were. So I thought, well, you know, am I, can I run this company when it's at 100 employees or 500? Not all founders are cut out to run the company perpetual. I also didn't want to sell GeekSwap or take investor money because at some point investors want to sell and cash out. And I knew GeekSwap was profitable, but not profitable enough to go public and spew out billions of dollars of profit. Yeah. Um, service is different. You really got to – most service businesses that are great are populated by people who love the business. They make a decent profit. And GeekSwap is going to be profitable, but not as profitable without a partnership with like a Best Buy. So, And I knew that they needed us, and they also happen to be based in Minnesota. And I wanted to find out, what's it like to work at a $50 billion company? Could I last and, and survive um, you know, in that size? And what I learned at Best Buy in a company that size is that they don't really know anything more than what you learn at a startup. That was the big revelation. That's what I learned in 10 years there. Now, we had a great relationship, and I still have a great relationship with the people at Best Buy. I mean, it's the world's greatest adult toy store um, there ever was. And uh, but now that I know, now I'm ready to start another company. I'll self-finance it. You know, I'm very proud that GeekSquad is almost 20 years old. I did okay. The, almost all the employees that were there are, are still there, very happy, or they've moved on and started their own companies. Mm-hmm. It employs a huge number of people. You know, I mean, and Best Buy did very well with GeekSquad. It's considered very valuable for them. They're obviously struggling. But I feel good that I sold them something that was worth something and didn't die off. I, I do tend to you know, get a little frustrated looking at people who build companies and like sell them two years later. And then like five years later, is that company still around? That just, I'm interested in building something that's going to be around for like – now I want to build something that's going to be around for like 100 years. I mean as an American, I look at European culture and think – they have like buildings that are a thousand years old. <laughs> they have com- they have companies that are hundreds of years old. I like the idea of you know building something that's going to be around a lot longer than I am. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about um, what kind of company you envision to be the sort of company that might last a thousand years. Quickly, I want to take a quick break and thank Ford for sponsoring this episode of Triangulation. Ford is so great. I mean, we're talking about the next stage of technology. I mean, look no farther than Ford if you're talking about vehicles. Um, one of the one of the coolest parts is Sync's entertainment features in in Ford Sync. If you haven't played around with Ford Sync yet, it is the coolest. You can browse your music collection by a genre that you like. You want to play rock stuff. You have a particular album in mind, artist playlist all using voice commands. That's sort of the kicker, right? You're in your car. You don't have to fumble with anything. Even if you have an uh, iPhone hookup, you don't have to do any of that stuff. You basically just talk to your car and you get your music played back to you. Sync allows voice activated control of a media player as well, if you've got one. So if you can play a list of music you're in the mood for, uh, if I'm in the mood for electronic music, that sort of thing. You know, or I have a particular song that I'm interested in. I'm like, yeah, I want more of this. You can say something like, play similar music, and you'll get that. It's great. Really, really helpful, especially if you're in the car as a sort of a hostage for a while. You can listen to your entertainment on a pretty much any device. Voice control music, no matter how you store it, really. So smartphones via Bluetooth uh, on a USB drive. Um, If you've got media on a drive, on an MP3 player, like an iPod or an iPad. We've all got those, right? Some of us, anyway. iTunes tagging. This is the coolest. You don't have to remember the name of a song that you just heard. You just use available sync with My Ford Touch and HD Radio with iTunes tagging. What happens is it lets you tag a song that you like. You transfer that info to your iPod. Well, it does for you. It's easy. And then you can purchase the song from iTunes later. So you're just like, boop done and then later on you can you can impress your friends with this great song uh that 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 came across your 
your radio when you were driving. Ford offers sync on every 2012 and 2013 Ford vehicle sold in the U.S. of A., including the 2012 Ford Focus. Very popular car, and you can learn more about what Ford is doing in sync and a lot of other just, I mean, absolutely amazing technological advances in Ford vehicles at Ford.com slash technology. We love Ford. Such a great partnership. Um, if you watch any of Leo's podcasts, you know he really never stops talking about Ford because <laughs> it's fun to drive. Thanks again to Ford. That's Ford.com slash technology. We are here with Robert Stevens, founder of Geek Squad and Best Buy CTO, was it, for 10 years? Uh, I was CTO just for like the last two and a half years. So what were you initially when, when you became... When, when you acquired Best Buy? Well, Best Buy didn't, it only had a small service offering, so Geek Squad kind of became that and scaled it. So I called them in 2000. We dated for two years before we got married. Uh-huh. You know, and that helped a lot. I think, you know, same thing like with any relationship. I mean, we got to know each other, and I spent two years trying to talk myself out of it. It was either do a deal with Best Buy, because I knew Circuit City, their stores were just dirtier. You know, you, we all walk into stores, and you can tell, like, how things are stacked mm-hmm. nicely and neatly. Best Buy stores were cleaner and brighter. Um, and, yeah, I mean, there was Computer City and CompUSA. CompUSA stores were just a, a mess. Uh, and um, so it was either partner with the best or just take 20 years to grow GeekSwad. I knew GeekSwad would grow to 20,000 employees. When I was 22, I thought it would happen in a year. You can do that, but I would have to give up probably 80% control, raise yeah. a ton of money. And, you know, I, I read up. I follow all you know other people's stories and read biographies, and it helps you predict the future. And you go, boy, is that how what I would have wanted? Like Richard Branson has taken Virgin Private at least two times, and you know I'm sure Mark Pincus of Zynga is not having a blast right now being a public company <laughs> mm-hmm. at a two dollar whatever stock price. So I don't hear a lot of people going, "Wow, it's so fun to be a public company." Yeah. So I think that. That's a cheap way to get smart about things that you haven't experienced before. So uh, when I came into Best Buy, I had somebody I worked with, and we spent another two years just studying what it would look like to scale, what parts, you know, what would the, where would we take over in the store. And we had to kind of build up a whole bunch of things and build up a crew of people to fly around the country and train people. I mean, it's incredibly complex. Uh, uh, Geek Squad and Best Buy uh, definitely deserve uh, their share of criticism, but there's a reason there's not eight other or even two other Geek Squads. Mm -hmm. There's nobody else. It's really, really hard to do this. I guarantee you Apple will never offer in-home service. The idea of sending any human beings out of a place where you can monitor them into people's homes, it's very complex. It's expensive. Um, well, that's why Apple has all of us come to their stores where they can control the experience, right? Yeah, and they have like one bars. brand. I own all Apple products. Uh, I love them. I think they're great. Um, but like, every, I think we all expect them to come up with a large flat screen TV. Are people going to carry those giant boxes out of the stores? Now, most younger people might hang them. And if they get thin and light enough, um, they will be light enough for you to hang them yourself. Right. And maybe Apple's sort of waiting for that. But still... It's a complex piece of thin glass that's very expensive, it's, and I don't see Apple contracting that out to third parties, and I agree with that idea 100%. I think if it touches a customer, you should not outsource it. You should own that labor. Mm-hmm. If it doesn't touch the customer directly, hell, outsource the crap out of it. I mean, that's where it's going to be very interesting with the sharing economy, if we have these dispatch engines that can dispatch anybody to do any task for you, um, quality control is going to be a big issue. And then there's a certain social issue too. Um, is everybody going to become an independent contractor in the future and have no actually guaranteed employment? Uh, how will anybody budget to spend money at, at the holidays? So this whole technological thing is going to play itself out in terms of people and jobs and in the economy. So you said that you were CTO for the last two years or so of the 10 years that you were with Best Buy, and you left uh, in March of this year, That's correct? Right. Yep. So after 10 years, which is a very long time to stay at a, at a company after acquisition, as, as you know, what finally changed? Well, I, I never thought I'd last that long. Like I said, I went in there going, okay, there's only certain things you'll see at a startup. 
five, ten, twenty employees. In fact, it's, it's always like a different company every six months. Mm-hmm. You know, because you know, at ten employees or a hundred employees or your first million in revenue, you outgrow your accounting system or you outgrow your bookkeeper, you outgrow your phone system. And so growth is never a curve. It's a series of stair steps and it's those flat periods where it's boring as hell and you're itching to get out. Um, so, you know, I wanted to kind of figure that out. Um, mm-hmm. I'd love to be a serial entrepreneur. I mean, looking back on God, 18 years, I feel glad that I can focus on something since I'm a two-time college dropout. But I do like the idea of like, you know, trying to start something and really move much faster next time. So that's kind of what I'm looking forward to. So 10 years was kind of like, that's it. I've done everything I can for them. Sometimes, you know, if I'd have stuck around any longer, I think it would have been for the wrong reasons. Uh, But my daughter, uh, you know, is 14 and she just entered high school this fall. So if I was going to move to California, I've lived in the Midwest 43 years. I paid my dues. I wanted to experience a different city. Mm -hmm. I actually moved to San Francisco less for the tech, but more for the food and just the the terrain and the outdoors. Um, So it's either move now or wait four years till my daughter goes to college. So the timing was perfect. It was a nice even 10 years at Best Buy. I wrapped up my deal there. Mm -hmm. My daughter's going to high school. My wife was up for a move. She had never lived outside of Minnesota. Um, So, and San Francisco's like New York and Italy combined. I found this um, this really great... uh it's almost like a goodbye letter uh, to you at geeksquad.com. Uh, I guess when the agents had, had learned that you were going to move on, um, it was Thursday, March 8th. And there, I don't know if you've read this, but there are all these quotes um, that I guess uh, Agent Ron G had pulled uh, from variety people uh, who had these really nice things to say about you. Um, what started as a job quickly turned into adventure, one which I will be forever in your debt for sending me. I am so proud to be part of the family that you've brought to us and the culture that's so special and really, really so genius. Thank you for bringing your brilliance to us all. I mean, they, they go on and on. I don't know if you've seen this before. But uh, it's real. I, I mean, a bit of that. Yeah, I mean, it's like, yeah, I don't know if these are all people who had been with you since the beginning or that just really believed in the vision, even though it had become a huge part of a huge company where, let's be honest, you know, a lot of times people don't have a huge personal investment in their careers when they feel like they're just one of many. Well, when I um, was going to start Geek Squad, I was really nervous because I'm good at repair. I can fix anything. I'm very good at technology. Mm-hmm. It's one thing to be good at something. It's a whole other thing to be good to others and be a good manager. I'm impatient. I'm a perfectionist. I'm kind of a pain in the ass to work with and I I push really hard. I was worried, am I going to be an asshole, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, to other employees? I don't even know if I'm capable of managing people. Right. Um, So that's part of what I wanted to find out on my own is what my own limits were. It's incredibly gratifying um, to do that because – like you know, my father was like always home at five o'clock and I think he probably even – he he was successful but he – you know, he was like middle class in Chicago, worked at Allstate, was in the Navy 20 years. He had seven kids. But my, my dad was home like every day and for me, I can't be successful in business if, you know, the customers aren't happy, the employees aren't happy and then I look at the balance sheet and the profit. Like yeah. so in some ways that might make me a crappy business person because – you know, I think one of the key things for a brand or a leader or a person is, are there things you wouldn't do even if you'd make a buck doing them? And I think there's a lot of companies that do things uh, just to make a buck, and that's not really for me. So that's really gratifying. But what I learned uh, with that, first of all, my reaction to those comments whenever they thank me is – you know, I feel like I can't believe you wore that silly uniform and <laughs> rode around the geek mobiles, uh, you know, and, and felt that part of the vision. I mean, uh, that, I'm amazed by that. So I feel grateful. Uh, and what I learned, though, is that everybody, not everybody's motivated by money or power or fame. So the question as a leader is how do you motivate everybody in your company? And the key is nobody wants to lead a boring life. And I don't care how boring the business is. If I ran a drywall contracting company or a submarine sandwich shop or a car wash, no matter how big or small your company is, the, everybody wants to be touched and have a sense of purpose. They want to have great managers. I mean, they say people don't leave companies, they leave managers. Mm-hmm. And what I learned is that it doesn't matter what business I do next. I don't even know what I'm going to do next. But whatever I do, I learned a lot about 
who people want to work for, what gets them out of bed in the morning. And listen, if we can make computer repair a little less boring and a little more fun on the freeway when we drive by and give you a chuckle, um, every business is like that. And I hope that they go on either to start their own companies or as they remain at Best Buy or work for anybody else, that they become like really good advertisement. Um, but I'd like anybody that is outside of the Geek Squad looking in maybe to think about there's so many areas in your in – your, it's not just the customer experience you have to design. But almost more importantly is the employee experience is the key. If the employees don't believe it, the customers will feel it. Mm-hmm. What was the uh, was there was there a particular repair um, that the Geek Squad was always having to do over and over that everyone sort of grumble about? It was like maybe even something that that wasn't a repair you had to make back in 1994 because the technology didn't exist yet. Uh, you know that's where computer repair is really really tough. You know uh, it's gotten a lot easier now um, with the operating systems, but no, I would say technicians in any industry like ones that are easy mm-hmm. because you know the clock is ticking and you know um, it's, it's like car repair uh, if you know it's easy that's better because you can do more it's faster you know but the hardest ones always were like partition corruption mm-hmm. because you know windows crashes dll errors were always tricky because sometimes a bad ram chip sometimes a bad logic board sometimes it was software corruption or driver corruption that's incredibly difficult to to troubleshoot properly so things are a lot different now and they've gotten a lot easier uh and then what that's taught us is that it, even you know if computers don't crash will there be a geek squad the answer is yes because um it's not just about waiting for things to break you know, it's setting things up, it's transferring data, it's yeah. installation, it's training. One of the fastest growing uh, businesses at GeekSquad is remote service. So as things get connected, your Nest thermostat, your ports, I mean home automation alone. A home automation from light switches to temperature sensors to security cameras, Not ev- most people are not going to set all this up themselves. And even if they could, who's going to maintain the monitoring and all the rules? Like, okay, what time do you want your ports light on until late? But what if you're having a cocktail party? Um, you know, what about security cameras? Where should they be placed? Are they on the Wi-Fi signal? What if you change your Wi-Fi password? What Wi-Fi password do you pick? I mean, most people are never going to do this. And if somebody comes along with a flat rate, I mean, that's why I really can't believe there's not more than one, like, National Geek Squad. I still think there's a lot of room. Don't just think that because iPads never crash, and they really don't ever crash. They're amazing. Um, <laughs> there's a lot more room. Robotics, home automation, and even like personal health tech fitness are three like other big growth areas that are just very small right now. Did you get a kick out of uh, Geek Squad being written into episodes of The Office? For example, well, or- that's because we showed up and did their computer support, and so for like <laughs> really? the wardrobe guy, yeah, because really? if you look on the show, they actually had a geek mobile. We said these cardboard, uh, our our brochures used to fold into origami geek mobiles, because <laughs> I, you know, couldn't afford to waste marketing material. Uh, uh-huh. um, and you'll see one of them. I think it's in episode one. It was taped to one of the guys' uh, monitor. That's how we got into there. We're in a bunch of movies. We're in like Mighty Ducks three, uh, stuff like that. Um, the movie, the TV show, Chuck. Is based on us. NBC came. Oh, they call it the Nerd Herd or the Nerd. Yeah, it's a total or, ripoff. They came. Yeah. NBC came to me like six years ago and said, "Babes, love Geek Squad. Let's do a TV show." <laughs> and I'm like, "I'm not giving you control of my brand uh, on national television." They're like, "Oh, we'll pay you." I'm like, well, "How how much are you going to pay me? A hundred million dollars?" Because the business makes a lot more than that, yeah. uh, you know, right. than what you're going to pay. And in two or three years, I said, "And if you ruin the show or have a crappy storyline." I still have a business to run with the same logo. They're like, well, we're going to do the show anyway. I'm just going to, you know, with or without you. And I'm like, go ahead. If you copy me, I designed my brand. So if you copy me, everybody will know who you're copying. And sure enough, you know, they have gray ties instead of white shirts. And it's red and white instead of black and white. It was perfect. I actually never thought the show was that good. But it, a lot of Geek Squad agents liked it. And I just thought I could never decide whether it was a comedy or an action thing. So it was kind of stupid. But... It was on the air, I think, like four or five years, which is a miracle. It's perfect, though, because if, yeah, if they had used the Geek Squad brand and it was a crappy show, then it could bring down the brand. But instead, it's just sort of an homage and everyone gets what it means. And if it's a crappy show, it doesn't matter because it's not your brand. Yeah, if the show doesn't succeed, 
then it's because art was unable to imitate life, meaning that we were so good. Like, we're still... See, the problem of going to a James Bond movie as a kid, and even this weekend when I went and saw it, like, you know, I still feel like I want to be, like, a secret agent when I walk out of a James Bond movie. <laughs> but then you're like, oh, James Bond's not for real. I tell them, saying, the difference between Geek Squad and James Bond is Geek Squad's for real. Like, these people get to go and save people every day. It might be a hard drive crash, but to the customer, it's like, you saved my life. Right. I, I lost my thesis uh, and stuff like that. So they get to be James Bond four times a day to five times a day. Um, but the fact that the, if the Chuck show succeeded and it lasted far longer than I thought it would, um, it's people still it's still a reference point, and that's an important lesson. There's ways to derive from things, even if they don't have your exact logo on them. The other thing, too, though, is... If you're original enough, even when people copy you, you just make it really hard to copy. And I thought, nobody's going to bother to steal their fashion sense from the federal government, like NASA with clip-on ties. So, and that can be done in any business. If I ran a pest control company, oh my God, I would have giant insect mobiles, you know, because... It would stand out on the freeway. <laughs> okay, well, we, uh, we've definitely uh, got some more time to talk about what you want to do next. Um, and I'm sure that you have some ideas, too. Before we do, let's take one last break. We want to thank Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. Now, that might sound like one of these boring companies that, that Robert's been talking about. But actually, this is really cool because think about it. If you're in the business of making media, you've got a blog or website. Uh, you make videos, you make films, uh, you're an app builder, all sorts of types of media you might not have at your fingertips. You know, you, you, want, a, you want an image of people rafting down a river? I don't know, do you live near the side of the river? Uh, do, you need, do you need images of, of, of escalators lit up you know, with neon lights, that sort of thing? Things come up, right? And you don't have access to all of this and you just can't steal the stuff off the internet. That's not the way to do it. That's why Stock Media and Pond5 is the way to go. you got professional quality stock media. One of the best ways is just be creative. You know, you need a picture of a snail, you need some video of a snail, you have got it. It's a building block. It's a creative resource for you and your products. Photos, vector illustrations, music tracks, sound effects. We love the sound effects in the Twit edit, edit bay as I say, hey Jeff, let's get some, some sort of like a, like a sound effect of a paper ripping or something, you know, for this little gag on i5, that sort of stuff. Motion graphics templates, 3D models, and more. There's a lot more to Pond5 than just images uh, because we're not just making image-based media anymore. You need all sorts of stuff. All of Pond5 uh, media can be downloaded instantly for legal use in pretty much any media production with really good prices. So it's for developers, it's for designers, it's for videographers and, and filmographers. Pond5 has HD footage. And if you're an artist, you'll like it too. Uh, the traditional stock agency business uh, is yeah, it's kind of getting shaken up. You've got an open, artist-friendly marketplace for professional content here. If you're an artist selling on the site, Pond5 gives you the control over pricing. So you as the artist can say, you know what? I am willing to share this, but this is what this is worth to me. Pond5 will let you set your price. Plus, they pay out 50% royalties for each and every sale, and that's a higher payout uh, than the other stock photo marketplaces. You should really check out Pond5. If you're a creative person and you want to take it to the next level, upload your own content and put to work at the world's most artist-friendly marketplace for stock media. Guess what? This month you can get 50 free stock media downloads at pond5.com slash triangulation. Once again, pond, the number five, dot com slash triangulation. 50 free stock media downloads. We thank Pond5 so much for sponsoring this episode of Triangulation with our amazing guest, Robert Stevens. So uh, before we get into your vision for the future, I know you were mentioning to me that you were um, at the Dublin Web Summit and Founders, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. last month. Yep. What are the sorts of things that, uh, that, that, that you talk about when you're at a, at a speaking event? What, what is it that usually a, a conference like Founders will ping you for and say, you know, we really want you to talk to the group about this? Is it about starting a company? Is it about scaling a company? I didn't actually speak at... Uh uh, founders. No. Uh, that's an invite only event. Uh, but it's nice because it's all founders. Sure. And so it's like anything. If you're in the, you know, surfing and you're with your peers, it's, it, you know, it's being with people who've 
you know, eaten ramen noodle for five years and, you know, uh, made no money for many years before they did anything. Right. There, there's you a got com- something in There's common. a camaraderie there, yeah. Um, but uh, when people ask me to speak. I do some uh, speaking, you know, maybe five to ten things a year and I'll usually like if it's in Fiji or Tahiti I'll usually be like I don't care who you are I'll, yes I'll go there and I'll speak if it's, <laughs> yeah, I'll if it's other kind of more story. rural areas I might not uh, people usually ask me to talk about you know what you learn when you start a small company because I think one of the key things is what happens to any company when it goes from small to large what do you lose what do you gain mm-hmm. and what lessons did you learn and now I'm adding you know new chapters to that story about what did I learn inside a large company most of the people I know in the tech industry have never worked for a giant corporation and I went all the way up reporting to the CEO and I saw all levels and I was there for you know a total of 12 years and I wanted to learn as much as I could and um, and then there's also just the idea about how you differentiate yourself I mean, you know, 20 years ago, you had to have landlines and fax machines, and now you can get cloud servers spun up. You don't really need to own or spend a lot of money on things to start a company. Yeah. So it's even more exciting. But the rules still apply about how you have to be different. Um, The rules apply about how you attract great people and how you keep them and motivate them and inspire them. And um, so I tell stories and stuff like that. So now that you've lived in the Bay Area for three months, you said? Three months. So you're new, um, and you've never lived here before. You came from Minneapolis, where you'd lived for quite a while. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like, and you mentioned California as being an interesting place uh, earlier in the show, do you feel like there is a tech bubble here? Is it, is, it, is it really different in the way that people often, and many people that are watching our show sometimes accuse us of, because they go, you guys like these stupid apps that don't actually work anywhere else, except in somewhere like San Francisco, where mm-hmm. 50 of your closest friends are also using them. What, what's, what's striking you as the most different being new? It's hard to be a critic because... You know, then you read about people that, you know, make billions of dollars doing things. So, yeah. you know, I remember seeing MySpace going, that's the stupidest, ugliest website I've ever seen. They sold for $700 million, shows how much I know. Uh, I thought social network can be a big deal. I just thought MySpace. And I was sort of right. MySpace was a crappy design and Facebook was a, a better improvement on that. Um, you know, what I love about Silicon Valley and I love about the tech industry it's one of the few industries where we all wake up every day and our phone is out of date. There's a, there's a software update. <laughs> we're used to change, and that's good because people in every industry aren't used to this kind of change, and we're in a time of incredible change. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm kind of just starting over because I'm trying to, you know, remember what it was like to see the personal computer for the first time, and I remember what it was like to see the web for the first time, and I remember the first time I instant messaged with somebody. And then, you know, I remember the first iPhone I had. And now I'm trying to think what's going to be the next first thing for people in the next five to ten years. And so it's just about being curious and um, keeping an eye out for that stuff. So where do you see yourself landing as far as all this interesting technology? I mean, I know you can't predict everything that's about to be invented, but... Here you are. You say you want to be a you want to be a founder again. You want to be a CEO again. What what vertical is the most exciting to you? Is it that commodities business that you talked about earlier in the show, trying to figure out where an industry is inefficient to the point where something like an Airbnb or an Uber or a TaskRabbit could be built out? Well, I think this is something everybody can relate to because whether you work inside a large company or you're on a small team. Wherever you are and whoever you are, there are decisions you make every day. You might come up with the next great product idea that nobody thought of, even inside a large company. Or you might be founder of a small company, but what you're selling right now is not getting a lot of traction. You might be one pivot away from something different. The whole process of how you come up with the, the next best idea is about how do you kind of reset your own perspective and refresh your viewpoint? What do you get excited about? But, you know, we geeks can sometimes be a little too ahead of our time. I mean, there were a lot of startups back in 2000 that were great ideas. Mark Andreessen just said this, I think, a, a few days ago. There were a lot of companies, most of the companies in 2000 in the bubble were just 10 years ahead of their time. They just didn't have smart mobile phones and all and LTE networks yeah. and Wi-Fi to, to help them launch. So you can be a little too ahead of your time. So that's what's a little tricky about when you talk specifically about wanting to 
run a business. You know, I'm not going to be writing classical music scores <laughs> uh, for all time, and that's not my bag. Um, I really like the service business. I believe everybody's in the service business. What I tried to do to Best Buy was to show them that actually it wasn't about acquiring Geek Squad, but that if you start acting like a great service brand, people will perceive you as one. And I don't care how bad a, an airline is or a bank is, anybody can start today answering the phone quicker, listening to their on-hold experience, um, you know, empowering employees to just make the right decision, cutting the number of bull crap policies in half, making returns easier, all those little things every business can. So I really think that because of apps, because of the internet, because of transparency of YouTube, and customers will be recording these calls for quality purposes and, and putting them online, that every company needs to be reexamining the number of clicks it takes to do anything. I think that's going to be one of the biggest trends, and Square is a main reason for this, is that whether we realize it or not, we are all being trained by our smartphones to gravitate toward experiences that let us do it in fewer clicks. If I want to buy a flat screen TV and have it installed in my home, what is the fewest number of clicks to do so? From Amazon or Best Buy or Target or driving to the store, those all count as the number of clicks, the amount of time it takes, and what it costs to do. Same thing with booking a hotel room. Remember when you used to board a plane with a paper boarding pass? Then you yes. printed it at home. Now uh -huh. we just board with a QR code. You know, and now we've got Passbook. This is all about taking clicks out. And if there's nothing else, anybody else out there we're thinking about where to make an impact, whether an existing or a new business, is count the number of clicks it takes to do anything in any vertical. And look at the, the market leaders. You know, Square, when you pay without even taking your phone out of your your pocket and you can pay for coffee, that gets you down to zero clicks. That's where car rental, you know, national car, you can just go without even, you know, going to the kiosk. I still feel like something like Square and, you know, pay by Square that you're talking about, which I use and I love. I have a ritual roasters near my house and San Francisco, which is a nice coffee house, and now everybody knows where you live. Well, there's there's a few of them in the city, so they they could they already know anyway. I'm pretty open, uh, but uh, but I do often, you know, I sort of stand there, and they kind of look at me, and I look at them, and I say, I'm I'm Sarah on Square, and then they go, Oh yeah yeah okay, and then it's fine, right? So I haven't done anything, but it's like I'm still sort of prompting the barista to remember that there's this technology, mm -hmm. so it's like. It's, it's so close, um, but it's still something that people are just trying to grapple with. Oh, yeah, that's possible, and I work here, and I should be checking that. That's the difference between a founder and everybody else. The founder will see the, the, the possible future, not give up on it, and persist. You know, I can't tell you how many people are like, I don't, do, I don't know this email thing, or I don't, I don't even know what the Twitter is, you know, and it's mm -hmm. like... That's fine, but if you ever like want to advance your career or be a relevant executive, you know, like I judge especially leaders of any size company. If you're not on Twitter, then you don't exist to me. And I'm not saying that as some arrogant techno person. I'm saying that's at least one big space where your customers are online. And if you're not on there, your employees aren't going to be on there. And if your employees aren't on there, they're not listening to customers. And anybody can argue with me about that, but I'm passionate. So where you'll find me is where service can be made better in any business by using technology and the intersection of those two. And the other two areas that you are kind of themes with me, and I said this in my blog post back in March, is service technology, culture, and brands. Culture is how you, you sustain anything you build. And brands ultimately are the byproduct of all those, those first three. And I really love brands. I love logos. I love brands that have been around for 100 years. And um, why, you know, I, next thing I build, uh, I will probably self-fund. It might take me 20 years to build again. Um, but I intend on it lasting even longer than Geek Squad. Well, that would be successful indeed. Uh, Robert, we've come to the end of our hour on triangulation. Uh, this is really fun. Uh, thanks so much for telling us your story and a little bit of what, what you think is uh, coming down the pipe in, in years ahead. Nice to finally years. meet you in person. Yeah, it was nice to meet you too. And thanks for coming up. We have so many guests that are uh, in our Skype window here, which is very nice. But it's This is the last 
uh, lesson uh, for your audience is that, yes, I could have Skyped into some blurry video connection. Not if what a founder you, would do. If you have the opportunity to ever have better video, uh, pay attention to what shirt you wear mm -hmm. uh, for the contrast. Um, those little details matter. So if you can drive an hour and be in the studio, the audio and video, because what we're saying today will live forever on the Internet. Uh, I'm going to take your advice and wash my hair tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> Robert Stevens, uh, founder of Geek Squad, former uh, employee of uh, Best Buy, and now entrepreneur living in the Bay Area, eating a lot of really good food. Thanks again for being with us. And thanks to everybody for watching this episode of Triangulation. Who's going to be on next week? It's not going to be me. Will Harris and Ayaz Akhtar will be our guest and, and, and guestee host next week on Triangulation. Uh, until then, have a great week, everyone.